Hi, today we do a book review on possibly the best book to learn Python, but I'll let the decision on you. What I do know is that we are going to review Python Crash Course. And as a quick disclaimer, I'll try to keep this as hands-on as possible, but let's start with a little groundwork. Not entirely unimportant, what is the promise of this book? Well, Python Crash Course is a fast-paced, thorough introduction to programming with Python that will have you writing programs, solving problems, and making things that work in no time. Okay, is it only a book? Well, no, there are also online supplementary resources. Let's have a look at them. We can download them and we we'll get to that in a bit. Having that out of the way, we have our agenda. First of all, we cover whom this book is for. Then we make a comparison between the second and the third edition. Then we finally have a look at the contents of the book. And we wrap this up with a conclusion with a recommendation from my hand, whether you should buy this book or not. Whom is this book for? Well, to cut the long story short, it is for anybody. It doesn't matter. You don't need any programming experience. If you are interested in learning Python, this book is for you. Moreover, it is for all people that want to get up to speed as quickly as possible with programming to focus on working on interesting projects. So no enormous amounts of theory, just enough to get started, and then you can start working on meaningful projects. It is also for people that are looking for a transition into the IT field. For whom is this book not? Well, it is not for people that have already a strong foundation in Python programming. If you already have a strong foundation, and moreover, if you already have a specific interest in an area like artificial intelligence or data visualization, then this book is not for you. You should want to get into the weeds to learn about game development, data visualization, web development, and so on and so forth. Your interest has to be broad. Then the differences and similarities between the second and third edition. First of all, there's a difference between the text editor that we use and set up. In the third edition, we set up VS Code instead of Sublime Text. It is just a text editor. It doesn't really matter. But VS Code is more widely used nowadays, so it's a good thing that we have switched. Then, to keep up with the times, the newest methods and newest libraries are introduced, like Padlib and PyTest. And on top of that, the projects in the second part got restructured. They are more logical now. And last but not least, we use Platform as aids instead of Heroku as a platform to deploy our web app to. It is just a platform, it doesn't really matter, but it is a difference. But as a quick spoiler, I think at least 95% of the second edition got transferred to the third edition. So the changes aren't that dramatic. Then the contents of this book. Here I've listed out all the theory that you will learn, but we'll get to this later. Then we have the projects. As you see, we got three projects. The first project about game development, the second project is all about data visualization. And the third project is all about web development slash app development. We'll get to that in a bit. Finally, we are at the table of contents of the Python Crash Course, the third edition. Let's start with a quick rundown so you know what to expect. The book is divided in two parts. The first part is about the basics. In other words, it's just a theory. Here you learn how to set up your local environment, install Python, and so on and so forth, and then you transition into programming concepts. What you learn is about variables, lists, statements, dictionaries, user input and while loops, functions, classes, files and exceptions, and even my favorite, testing your code with the PyTest library. So you know all the theory to eventually move on to the second part, the project part. In the project part, you learn about game development, data visualization, and web development. Having said that, let's dive into two chapters of the theory part, so you get an idea how the book is structured and how you will learn to code. Here we are at the start, at chapter two, where we learn about variables and simple data types. Let's have a look here. As you see, there are several blocks of theory, and then you have a exercise as well. And you see a file name, hello world.py. What does that mean? Well, the following, you can go to your supplementary resources and there you can open the file. So when you open it, you see the same file here. 
So it is highly recommend that you type it out to get acquainted with the syntax, but know that all these files are also in the supplementary resources that you have downloaded. And that is freely available on the internet to download. Let's scroll a bit downwards. There's a lot of theory, but as you see, there are challenges throughout the entire chapter. Here we have a challenge to assign a message to a variable and then print a message. Of course, this isn't the most difficult, but if you somehow not manage to get this done, know that there are solution files as well. So again, we go to the supplementary resources and then we go to the solution files and to the second chapter. And there we see simple message.py. So we can open that and there we have an example how it should look like. And that applies to all the challenges that you have throughout the book. Every challenge has a solution file, so you never get lost. How beautiful is that? Let's move on to the next chapter. At random, I scroll to chapter four, working with lists. And the structure is actually the same. And it applies to all the chapters in the first part. And also in the second part, by the way. So you have several paragraphs of theory. Sometimes you have exercise files. And you have challenges throughout. Let's have a look here. So here we have a challenge about animals. Think of at least three different animals that have a common characteristic. Store the names of these animals in a list and then use a for loop to print out the name of each animal. Well, let's say that you try it, but somehow don't manage to pull it off. They can look up the answer as well. Let's have a look here. So if we go to the solution files again, chapter four, it is called animals. So we can open that. And here we have an example how you should pull this off. How awesome is that? So again, all the chapters are structured this way. I think you get the gist. Let's move on to the project. Here we are at the first project, the alien invasion game. And that actually consists of three chapters. Here we are at the first chapter where we have to create a fleet of aliens. Again, like in the first part, you have blocks of theory and some files. Again, I recommend to type it out to get acquainted with the syntax. But be aware that all these files are searchable and findable in the supplementary files that you have downloaded. So let me show that. So here we are at the chapter 13 of the solution files, and then we are at creating first alien, and then we have alien.py. And that's just the actual file like we have seen in the book, this one. Be aware of that. When we scroll downwards, we see that we slowly built our game out. And from an alien, it will transform into an entire fleet of aliens. But just like in the first part, there are challenges throughout. First, we have a star challenge. What do we have to do? Find an image of a star and make a grid of stars appear on the screen. And that is very challenging, I can say at this point. But like I've mentioned before, I repeat myself, I know, but you can find solutions to all the answers. So when we go to solution files, chapter 13, we can find stars and here we can find everything that you need to know. So when we open this one, we can start the game and you see this grid that you're supposed to create. So again, no worries. It is challenging, but you never get stuck. There's always a solution file and the entire structure that I lay out actually applies to the entire second part. So it doesn't really add value to go through the entire book, but I want to show you all the end products. So you get an idea what you will learn if you follow along. Let's start with the alien invasion game. So here we have it. So you can start it, no problem. There we go. And as you see, you have a ship and you can, yeah, shoot the alien fleet. You have a scoring and so on and so forth. Real game elements. So let's close this off. There's a lot of code in this file, but you also import a lot of modules from other files, as you see here. Here you create the alien. Here you have a separate module where you create buttons. Here you have a module where you create the ship and so on and so forth, which is really professional. In a lot of YouTube tutorials, you see YouTubers throw in all the files in one main file. That's not really the way you work in a professional environment. But in this book, you really learn the structure, how professionals work and how to integrate that. And is it only about following along and building a game? Well, no, I actually found out myself that I was able to create my own game with a lot of extra features that I searched up myself in the Pygame documentation with all the skills and tools that I've learned throughout the chapters. So let me actually show that. You have my own League of Legends spin-off. 
And when we start that, you see that it is a little bit different. The background is different. You have some game modes. The characters are different. We have a Ezreal here and a fleet of fiddlesticks. And what I also did was adding sound. I don't know if it's bearable, guessable, but that's actually not something that's being laid out in the book, but I was able to search it up in the Pygame documentation. So here we have the sounds module and that has been imported in the alien invasion main file. I think that's a solid proof that this book will not only teach you the skills to follow along, but to also learn to think for yourself. On to the next. What do we have to learn in this chapter? Well, first of all, we have something with data that we generate, as far as I can see it. Yeah. So here we have a die with six sides and with 10 sides, and we roll it 50,000 times. And what we want to do is to plot it in a bar graph with the help of the Plotly library. Let's run it. Yep. And here you see a breakdown of the results. Apparently, you have the biggest chance of throwing 10 and 7 and the least chance to have 2 or 16, which is completely logical. But it's nice to have such a breakdown. Then we have something about temperatures. Mm, oh, this is a comparison that I've made myself. So I've downloaded some data and that data that we have downloaded is visualized in this file here. So what we use here is the NumPy library and Matplotlib. We use the CSV files that we have downloaded and then we visualize it. There we go. And here you see a comparison between the low and high temperatures of both Rotterdam and Beverly Hills in the same time frame. Very cool. And then last but not least, visualization via the API, the powerful feature that is used so much nowadays. What do we have to do here? Well, we are using Plotly and we do an API call at GitHub. And what we visualize are the most stored Python repos. Let's have a look here. And how powerful is this? Here we have an overview of the most stored Python projects on GitHub with clickable URLs. So this is the most popular one, 238,415 K stars. Well, it will take a time before I make a repo that will become so popular. And then last but not least, as icing on the cake, the last project where you learn to build a website with the Django framework. It's called Learning Logs. Here you see all the files from the Django framework that are necessary to set up a website. Here are the templates where you work with HTML and CSS. Yep, it's not only about Python. So let's actually have a look here at the Django project, how it looks like. So open the terminal and what we can do is the following. Use manage.py and run the server. Yeah. And here you see the end result. How beautiful. What's also worthwhile to show is that you actually learn how to deploy this entire website to an external cloud service, apart from setting it up and styling it. What do I mean by that? Well, as you can see, we have a YAML file here, platform.yaml. And here are two other YAML files. And those are being used to push your website to an external server, an external cloud service to be precise. What do we mean by that? Well, the following, let's say that we change something on our local environment. So we go to learning log and let's say something in the template. This is the index, track your learning. Let's say that we add something here, hello YouTube. Let's save it and then we go back. Let's open it in the terminal and have a look at our git status. Yeah, there's being noticed that we have changed something. So we have to commit it. This is a version control system. You will also learn how to set up Git and how to learn with Git. Don't worry about that. But this is actually necessary to push it to this external website. Yep, there we go. Let's check the status. Yeah, and as you see here, we have to use Git push to push it to platform.sh, our external cloud provider. So let's use Git push. And there we go. There we go. Let's have a look at our URLs. Platform URL. Let's open the first one. And there we have our chains being committed to the cloud server. How powerful is that? 
So again, it is not only about working in your local environment. You also learn powerful tools that are being used in a modern workplace to collaborate and automatically deploy to a cloud service. So you also get in touch with a little bit of CI CD pipelines within the DevOps realm. How beautiful. So let's close this. And with this, I want to wrap it up. The conclusion, do I recommend you to buy this book? Well, if you are in the target group, then I will definitely recommend you to buy this book. Let's circle back. What is the target group? So if you don't have a strong foundation in Python programming already, but are willing to put in the work to get up and running as fast as possible to work on meaningful projects, yeah, then this book is for you. Also, if you're looking for a transition into the IT field, not only because of what you learn, but also the tools and the structures that you learn are very important. The way you set up projects in this book are particularly suitable to apply in large enterprise environments. And last but not least, you also learn to work with tools that are being used by professionals like version control, but also CI CD pipelines to automatically deploy your local applications to a repo somewhere in the cloud. And that is being very powerful to learn, especially again, because it is being used in a modern workplace. So you can't escape that. With these words, I want to wrap it up. I would say support the author for his awesome work and get a hold on this book. If you are somehow financial unable to buy this book, you can always reach out to me via email. Then I will send you a copy of this PDF file that we went through. That's also not a problem. Anyways, I'll thank you for watching and hope to see you in another video.